Hello, welcome, and thanks for joining us. This is our review and analysis of the epic Civil War film, Gettysburg. My name is Robert Kellerman. I'll be your host. I've visited the battlefield at Gettysburg several times. In addition, I've also watched the film Gettysburg several times. And I really believe that with history, the more you know, the more you see. And so if you know more about the battle and the film, as you're watching it, you'll be able to pick up and understand and appreciate a lot more of the film. So what we'll do today is we'll talk about the film. This is our latest film history program. And usually what we do for these types of programs is we talk about the historical context of the film. We give a brief overview of the plot summary we have things for you to look for or to focus in on. And then last but not least, everyone always wants to know, are these historical films accurate or not? And just to give you a spoiler, the film Gettysburg is considered very accurate. So let's talk about some of these other things. So I thought what I would do is discuss the film in the context of the Gettysburg battlefield itself. Perhaps you visited Gettysburg or are planning on doing so at some point in time in the future. And if you get a chance to watch the film, it'll really help you better understand the, the not only the battle, but the battlefield itself. Or perhaps you're not gonna be able to visit Gettysburg, the battlefield anytime in the near future, but you still wanna watch the film to learn more about it. So let's go ahead and discuss the film. So a brief overview of the film Gettysburg. The battle itself took place on July 1st through July 3rd of 1863. The film was released 130 years later in 1993. And it's a classic definition of an epic film. It's four hours and 14 minutes long. It was filmed on location at the Gettysburg National Park. Uh, it was actually the first film that was allowed to be shot at the battlefield. Um, and then some of the other scenes, actually quite a few of the other scenes uh, were actually filmed in the surrounding areas. Another thing that makes it epic, not only the length, but also the fact that thousands of Civil War reenactors were used as extras in the film, including over 3,000 for the Pickett's Charge scene, as you should be on the lookout for that. As I mentioned earlier, it's considered very accurate, so that's nice to see in a historical film. Uh, that's not always the case, but it is here. There's some kind of minor things here and there that uh, say Hollywood liberties were used, uh, but overall pretty accurate portrayal um, of the film. And in addition, it has a lot of other great features, including an excellent score, the cinematography, costumes, casting, special effects, uh, et cetera, all very well done. And overall, I would say that the film does a great job of capturing the essence of the Gettysburg battle from the generals all the way down to the individual soldiers. The film Gettysburg was based on the Pulitzer Prize book, The Killer Angels by Michael Chara. Uh, that was a book that came out several years before the film was actually made. And it really served as the basis of the script for the film. The director, writer, and co-producer was Ronald Maxwell. Um, he made a number of other films throughout his career um, or was involved in other other films. This was by far the high point of his career. And the person that provided the financial backing for the film was Ted Turner. Uh, at the time the film was made, he was the head of TNT and New Line Cinema. And of course, he was the founder of CNN among other things. All right, let's talk about the historical context of Gettysburg. So you might wanna take a screenshot of this or a picture with your phone as you're watching the film. So this is kind of like my list of things to be on the lookout for. Uh, so first and foremost, why and how was Gettysburg the battle won and lost? Uh, as you're watching the film, you can see a lot of things taking place and so something for you to uh, focus in on. Um, the film goes through early on about the invasion of the North by Robert E. Lee. Um, so you should be on the lookout for that. Uh, one of the things that I liked about the film is it really spent a fair amount of time getting into the military strategy and tactics, not only with General Lee and General Meade, 
um, but also some of their subordinates, and gentlemen like Buford and Longstreet, Chamberlain, uh, and several others. We'll talk about those later in our program. Um, another key aspect of the film was the Confederate military intelligence, uh, and that was uh, in relation to Generals Jeb Stewart, and also this character uh, named Harrison, who was a Confederate spy. Um, another interesting thing is the fact that the Gettysburg battle location was really kind of a chance encounter. Sometimes when there's a, a military engagement, uh, it's kind of planned out ahead of time that this is where the battle is going to take place. Um, that was not the case here. It was, for the most part, a chance encounter, you could say. Um, and then the battle is three days, to July 1st through July 3rd. The first day of the battle, um, all three days of the battle have many different aspects to them. Uh, but the first day really focuses on Seminary Ridge and Union General John Buford. We'll talk about him a little bit more in just a bit. Uh, the second day focuses on Little Round Top and Union General Joshua Chamberlain. And then day three focuses on the culmination with Pickett's Charge, and in particular, the decisions um, and tactics of Generals Lee, Longstreet, and Pickett. Um, we'll also talk about the Killer Angels, that actual term, Killer Angels, and how that relates to the story. And then also, too, I really liked how the film kind of captured the motivations of these men. Why were they fighting? What were they fighting for, etc.? And then you see a lot of the camaraderie uh, between the individual soldiers throughout the film. So prior to Gettysburg, about two months before, Robert E. Lee was involved in a famous battle in Virginia at Chancellorsville. And Lee routed his Union counterpart, General Hooker. Um, you can see this visual from our friends at the Encyclopedia Britannica uh, shows the fact that Lee's number, Lee's army, was greatly outnumbered by hookers, uh, 130,000 to 60,000. But that being said, uh, Lee and his subordinate Stonewall Jackson inflicted heavy casualties on the Union Army, uh, 17,000 casualties versus only 12,000 lost on the Confederate side. And they really whipped uh, General Hooker, so to speak. So this is two months before Gettysburg, just so you have this historical context. And so after the Battle of Chancellorsville, what's going to happen next? Well, Hooker uh, essentially retreats to a certain degree, and Lee now has to decide what he's going to do. So where is he going to go? What's his next action going to be? He's not going to go south um, because Richmond is down in this direction. So he doesn't want to bring the Union Army closer to Richmond. That's the capital of the Confederacy, of course. Um, he could go north. But the concern that Lee has is if he stays in the Northern Virginia area, he's really concerned about exhausting the food and other supplies that this area uh, would need to support the army. So he'd really preferred not to be in Northern Virginia because he wants the farms uh, and the other kind of support apparatus time to kind of replenish uh, themselves. He doesn't want to attack Washington DC uh, because he knows it's heavily fortified. So that's really out. Um, he doesn't want to go too far out west um, because he does need to keep his army somewhat close to, uh, say, Richmond and Northern Virginia. Um, so that kind of really leads the only option is to go north, uh, which was somewhat of a risky proposition, of course. But when you look at it in the context of his other options, he can't retreat south to Richmond because that would bring the Union Army close to Richmond. Um, he can't stay in Northern Virginia because the farms need time to replenish. Uh, their agricultural supplies and things like that. Uh, he can't go too far out west. Um, he can't go attack Washington, D.C. And so he thinks that the best course of action is to go north and take the fight to the Union. Um, the other advantage that would have is if he was successful in drawing the Union Army out into the open um, in this area, then perhaps he could defeat the Union Army and then somehow get a peace settlement from the United States. So that's kind of Lee's thinking uh, when he ends up invading the North in the summer of 1863. Now, Lee had had a previous invasion of North 
in the fall of 1862, which culminated in the Battle of Antietam. And it's interesting to kind of look and compare the Battle of Antietam and the Battle of Gettysburg to kind of compare and contrast those two. As far as Gettysburg goes, I mentioned this battle was fought July 1 through July 3rd of 1863, kind of ironic, uh, right before the 4th of July Independence Day. Um, and you can see here from the headlines, this is a nice visual, again, from our friends at the Encyclopedia Britannica. The Northern victory turns the tide of the war. So at this point in time, uh, prior to Gettysburg, the war had been mostly going in favor of the Confederates, uh, particularly in this uh, Eastern theater of the campaign. Uh, but with this big battle taking place, uh, you can see Meade, he has 88,000 troops at his disposal. Lee has 75,000. Um, and after a severe amount of fighting, a number of casualties taking place, Lee is was forced to abandon his invasion of the North and return to Virginia. So a real turning point. Uh, in fact, most people probably consider this to be the number one turning point uh, in the Civil War, the Battle of Gettysburg. So that's why it's so important. Now, as I mentioned previously, Lee had invaded the North and ended up in Maryland uh, fighting at the Battle of Antietam. And if you ever get a chance, uh, you should also visit Antietam. It's probably much, much too much uh, to visit both Antietam and Gettysburg on the same day. Um, they are in somewhat close proximity, driving range to one another. Uh, but that being said, they definitely deserve their own uh, individual visits. And if you look at the Battle of Antietam, which was very important um, because, number one, it repelled Robert E. Lee from his first invasion of the North. Uh, also, this victory ends up leading to Abraham Lincoln uh, announcing the Emancipation Proclamation and et cetera, et cetera. So the Battle of Antietam, very important through the course of the Civil War. If you compare it from like a numeric standpoint though, um, compare and contrast with Gettysburg, you can see that in Antietam, there were 69,000 Union troops fighting 52,000 Confederates. Whereas in Gettysburg, there were 88,000 Union troops fighting 75,000 Confederates. And then if you look at the casualties, uh, about 26,000 between the two armies. Um, and over here, the Union casualties were 23,000 and a little bit harder to figure out the Confederate casualties. Uh, the numbers usually range anywhere from 20 to 28,000. So almost twice as many casualties at Gettysburg than there were at Antietam, though both battles very, very important. And again, here's a close up of that. And then if you're not familiar with the geography, um, Gettysburg is in Pennsylvania, just a little bit north of the Maryland state line. And the battlefield itself is run by the National Park Service. They do a great job of maintaining the site. And if you've never been there before, it's a really beautiful area. It's this farming and agricultural area of Southern Pennsylvania, um, South Central Pennsylvania. They've done a great job of maintaining the battlefield in kind of this pristine condition, the way it looked um, before the uh, battle itself or during the battle itself. But even the whole surrounding area is just really beautiful countryside. Um, and then again, it's great to go here. So for me personally, uh, I visited this site many, many times. I'm originally from Detroit, Michigan. That's where I grew up at. And just really cool to finally visit the battlefield um, after reading about it through you know, so much of my childhood um, and early adulthood to be able to go there uh, and see all these things I'd read about and um, seen and things like that. And so they, again, really do a great job of maintaining the site. And they have a lot of special programs throughout the year. So if you're going to be visiting, you should be on the lookout for that. Things like reenactments and demonstrations and lectures and all different types of stuff. So that's the battlefield at Gettysburg. And the battle itself featured Confederate General Robert E. Lee going up against Union General George Meade. Lee was not fighting Ulysses S. Grant at this point in time. We'll explain why that was the case a little bit later. Um, and one of the things that's really noteworthy in the film, as I mentioned, is the decision-making as far as military strategies uh, or military strategy and tactics between Lee and Meade and their various subordinates. So that's one of the things that you should be on the lookout for the film, because if you're trying to see, well, 
why did um, you know, why was the battle won or why was it lost? Um, how was it won? How was it lost? This decision making process um, from the two sides really plays an important part in the story. So you should be on the lookout for that. And again, not just Lee and me, the two top guys, uh, but also their subordinates who ended up making course numerous decisions themselves. And again, just kind of going through the film Gettysburg in kind of the context of the battle and the battlefield itself. So let's go ahead and talk about that. Now, spoiler alert, um, probably already know this, but the Union won <laughs> the Battle of Gettysburg. In fact, they won the war too, uh, but just want to uh, uh, make sure I go through the film. I tried not to um, go over too many spoilers. There's a few spots where I do have to kind of talk about what happened, but some of the things I left it open. So if you watch the film, I didn't want to steal all the thunder of the drama, uh, so to speak. So some of the spoilers we'll talk about, but some of the others we'll skip over and you'll have to watch the film yourself to see what happens. All right, so let's talk about the film itself. It's actually a two-part film. Uh, each section is a little bit over two hours. The first part of the film Gettysburg talks about the day one of the battle that kind of centers around Seminary Ridge and then day two, which centers around the little round top. There was um, a lot more aspects of the battle that the film wasn't really able to cover or go into great detail, even though it was over four hours long um, because the battle took three days um, of fighting and then you know, several days leading up to the battle and uh, covers a large geographical area and all these people. So there's only so much they could cover, um, but the film does kind of focus on three kind of particular aspects. So one of the things that's really important to understand, and the film does a good job of explaining this, is the Confederate military intelligence or the lack of military intelligence. Um, you think about the Confederate army, they're marching into the Union and they don't have as friendly of um, uh, reception there from the locals, so to speak. So they're really much more challenged, the Confederates are, when they're fighting away from the Virginia because they're not on their home turf anymore. And so the film talks about the um, impact that General Jeb Stuart and this Confederate spy Harrison had on the battle. Now, um, Jeb Stuart, he was a cavalry commander uh, of the Confederate Army. He was essentially uh, the eyes and ears of the army. That's what the cavalry did uh, during the Civil War. They provided information as far as the enemy position and also the strength. Um, and you know the communications and the technology back then, uh, much less than it is today, of course. And so the cavalry oftentimes provided the military leadership with information on the enemy, how many soldiers are out there, where are they at, uh, so that the armies could then make their plans and then act accordingly. Um, his career, Stuart, he was extremely successful uh, during the Civil War, except at Gettysburg. Uh, this was really kind of like the low point of his career by most uh, historians account. Uh, the reason being is because for much of the Battle of Gettysburg, he's away from Robert E. Lee. Uh, Stuart had gone out on this raid. He was out um, outside of the Gettysburg vicinity, so to speak, for several days. And so Lee is really hard pressed because he doesn't have Stuart providing him the information um, on what's going on with the Union Army in terms of their size and their position. Uh, and things like that. So in the film, he's mostly just mentioned. Um, Stuart is, you do see him in a couple of scenes, uh, but his role or his impact on the film is pretty significant. Just the fact that he was not available during the battle and that was uh, like a historical, it was very historically accurate how it was portrayed in the film. Now there's this interesting character um, that in the film that you might think, oh, that's gotta be like a Hollywood thing. Cause there's this guy <laughs> and he's an actor, but he's also this Confederate spy and he's giving um, uh, Lee and Longstreet uh, information on what the Union Army is doing. You might think, oh, that's gotta be like a made up Hollywood thing. No, it's actually a true story um, because Stewart was not available. Um, the Confederates ended up relying on this guy named Harrison to provide them information as to what's going on. So when you see this character in the film, uh, that's pretty much the way it happened uh, in real life. So that's why I wanted to point that out. And he, the information that he gives uh, to the Confederates is the fact that the Union Army is moving north uh, towards Pennsylvania 
Um, so they're kind of on this uh, destination course with Robert E. Lee's army. And then he also reports to Longstreet and then later Lee that General Meade has replaced General Hooker as head of the Union Army. So if the battle uh, would have been fought earlier, it would have been Lee going up against Hooker, uh, but because Hooker was replaced by President Abraham Lincoln with General Meade, it's going to be Lee going up against Meade. And the person that hired Harrison, so to speak, was Confederate General James Longstreet. Um, now, in the film, he's played by Tom Berenger. Uh, Longstreet, very well-known Confederate general. He was a, like many of the Civil War commanders, he went to West Point, graduated in 1842. And after Lee... Um, there's, there's a number of commanders that report to Lee, but during this particular battle, he's essentially the number two guy after Robert E. Lee. Um, at Gettysburg, his role in both the battle and the film is he has a lot of strategy disagreements with Robert E. Lee. Um, Longstreet thought that they should not fight at Gettysburg. He thought that they should maneuver around that area and go fight the Union somewhere else, particularly somewhere where they could get the high ground, which they did not have at Gettysburg. Um, Lee, though, thought that they should fight there and ended up um, suffering the consequences of that. Now, after the war, Longstreet becomes this very controversial figure because well, you can't question Robert E. Lee. So, uh, you know, if, if the Confederates lost a battle, it couldn't possibly be the great Robert E. Lee's fault. It must be somebody else's fault. Uh, and so people like Longstreet and Jeb Stewart and others uh, tend to get the blame for things, for better or for worse. Um, and then again, during the film, Longstreet is portrayed by Tom Berenger, a very well-known actor, very talented actor. I thought he really did a fabulous job uh, kind of, humanizing uh, James Longstreet. We've, we've heard the names of some of these generals or other key uh, Civil War figures, uh, but you know who these people are and what they're like. Uh, really a great way to learn about that is by watching the film. And I really, really liked uh, Tom Berenger's portrayal of General Longstreet, even though Longstreet himself, um, since the Battle of Gettysburg, or really since the end of the Civil War, has been a very controversial figure um, in terms of whether or not um, he was successful, uh, so to speak. And if you go to Gettysburg, um, you can find a lot of things related to Longstreet there. So for instance, they have this nice statue that was put up not too long ago. And again, in the film, he's portrayed by Tom Berenger. So you can be on the lookout for that. Now, a person who is well known on the Confederate side of things, in fact, probably the second most famous um, Confederate military person after Robert E. Lee is General Stonewall Jackson. And you might be watching the film saying, well, where's he at? How come he's not in the film? Well, the reason he's not in the film Gettysburg is because he was killed eight weeks prior to the Battle of Gettysburg. He was killed on May 10th, 1863, after the Battle of Chancellorsville. And he was killed in a friendly fire incident um, by his own troops. So he's not alive anymore. When the Battle of Gettysburg takes place, there's always been a lot of kind of what if uh, type of discussion or debate on how things would have played out at Gettysburg at Stonewall Jackson um, still would have still been alive just because he was such an effective commander, but he was no longer alive. So if you're looking for him in the film, um, they do mention his name uh, periodically, uh, briefly, um, but he's not in the film because he'd already passed away. And the other person, though, that is very famous on the Confederate side is Robert E. Lee, of course, and he's played by Martin Sheen. Um, so in this picture, you can see Longstreet and Lee, or Behringer and Sheen. And Sheen um, was kind of a last minute addition to the cast. Uh, there were several other actors that were discussed or that were um, in the running to play Robert E. Lee is obviously a very important part, um, but the role finally ended up going to Martin Sheen. And if you have to think about it, um, this is perhaps the most difficult role in the film, uh, just because Lee is such a well-known, iconic figure. Uh, people have very strong opinions of Lee, um, et cetera, et cetera. And so probably the most difficult role in the film is Martin Sheen. If you read reviews of his performance, 
for the most part. Um, it seems like people, uh, critics and just the general public think he did a good job. I myself um, think he did a good job. Some people uh, maybe not as big a fan of this portrayal as uh, maybe some other depictions of Lee, but we'll leave that up for yourself to decide whether or not you give it thumbs up or thumbs down, so to speak. Robert Lee himself, again, played in the film by Martin Sheen. Uh, he actually survived the Civil War. Um, the Civil War ended in 1865. Of course, Lee passed away in 1870. He himself was a West Point graduate, uh, class of 1829. Uh, during the Gettysburg Battle, he's, of course, the commander of the Confederate forces. Um, and a big thing to be on the lookout for during the film is it goes into um, a little bit of detail as far as his invasion strategy in terms of uh, going into the north and then also his Gettysburg tactics. So I liked how the film um, delved into that. And if you go to the Gettysburg battlefield, of course, there's a lot of things that are related to Robert E. Lee. They have this big giant memorial with his men down on the base of the statue. And then, of course, Lee up on the top. And again, Martin Sheen, the great, uh, well-known, acclaimed actor portraying Robert E. Lee. So a big part of the battle that maybe is not as well-known among the public is what happened on the very first day at Seminary Ridge, in particular the role that was played by Union General John Buford. And this particular area of the battle was known as Cemetery Ridge. Uh, it was named after the Lutheran Theological Seminary. Um, so the photo on the left is a historical photo from the Gettysburg era. And then the photo on the right is a more recent depiction of the seminary. Now you'll see um, there's a few scenes early on in the movie where they're in this tower. And you might be like, Gene, Gosh, where is that? Well, it's actually this tower that was at the seminary. It was actually used um, by some of the troops during the Civil War or during the battle uh, to kind of get an elevated view. This is actually a view uh, from the seminary um, tower in more recent times. And you can see um, they have the great view up here. So, of course, this is before airplanes and drones and satellites and all that stuff. So, having an elevated view would be very advantageous. And so, the men ended up using uh, the tower of the seminary to kind of uh, get a bird's eye view of what's going on. And then early on in the film, this um, character played by Sam Elliott, who's Union General John Buford, he's out on patrol with his men and they end up coming across the Confederate army. Now, prior to this, they knew that Lee was moving north, but they didn't know exactly where he was at um, because again, the communication and military intelligence just not as strong uh, back then as it is today. And so Elliot, um, Sam Elliot, the character, or General John Buford, um, the real person, has to decide, gee, what is he going to do? He sees the Confederate Army. Um, Buford himself was a cavalry officer, and he has to decide what he's going to do. And you can see the film did a really good job of lining up actors uh, that looked very similar to their historical counterparts. Uh, so there's a picture of John Buford on the left, played by Sam Elliott on the right. And Buford was also a graduate of West Point, class of 1848. He was a cavalry officer. And his impact on the battle is he's essentially the person that identified, took, and held the quote-unquote high ground. So he really helped select the field of battle, um, and he's somewhat of an unsung hero of Gettysburg. He's not a very well-known name in terms of like the general public. Like people that study military history or Civil War history are very familiar with him, but I would imagine if he just walked up to a hundred random people on the street and asked them who General John Buford was, that 99% of them would have no idea. Um, but anyway, he plays a very important role in the battle because here's the city of Gettysburg, and the Union troops are kind of like south um, of the city. The Confederates are west of the city. And as Buford and his men are out on patrol looking for Robert E. Lee's army, um, he ends up seeing them from a distance. So Buford was in the cavalry. So those are horse um, mounted troops. The individuals that they saw were Confederate infantry and they were approaching the town of Gettysburg. And so Buford uh, kind of does a quick uh, assessment of the situation and notices there's 
several spots throughout the Gettysburg area that are quote unquote high ground, elevated positions. From a military standpoint, you're much better positioned if you're elevated uh, versus not. And so Buford really senses the importance of holding the high ground at Gettysburg. And you can see this large amount of Confederate troops that are approaching the town. And he thinks, okay, well, we need to, we being the Union, we need to hold the high ground. The problem was Buford's forces were greatly outnumbered by the Confederates. And so he's thinking that we just need to do what we have to do to hold the high ground uh, until the reinforcements can get here. But he really plays a pivotal role um, in the battle. Uh, because of this decision making that he's involved in. So the Battle of Gettysburg began here the morning of July 1st, 1863, when Union cavalry scouts under General Buford met General Confederate General Hill's army advancing from the west. Arrival of Je Confederate General Buell's army that afternoon drove Union troops to the south of the town. So it was really this chance encounter. It wasn't like they were, uh, they knew that the armies knew they were gonna face off somewhere in this vicinity, but they didn't know it would be at Gettysburg. So it was a real chance encounter. And then throughout the film, there's a lot of talk uh, like military slang and terminology and stuff like that, that. The general public might not be overly familiar with. They spend a fair amount of time, the actors uh, talking about regiments and brigades and divisions and corps and all that stuff. And there's also companies um, and you can see the sizes. So companies, several companies make up a regiment, um, several regiments make up a brigade, several brigades make up a division and several divisions make up a corps. So the reason that this comes into play is oftentimes what ends up happening, particularly during the civil war, is you'll have a smaller unit that, end, that finds itself going up against a larger unit. So you'll have a brigade that ends up encountering a division or a division end up encountering a corps or a regiment encountering a brigade, et cetera, et cetera. So that's what happens with Buford. He's a cavalry um, officer and the amount of troops under his command are much, much smaller than the Confederates that he sees coming down the road when, he, when Buford's here. Um, the number of troops that he had was a little bit over 2,000. Um, he saw several thousand Confederates, though, coming his way and knew that he was going to be greatly outnumbered. But that being said, he notices the, or realizes the importance of holding the high ground. So he says, well, you know what, I'll just fight it out here and hold the high ground as long as I can and hope that reinforcements get here. So again, you have a company is a smaller unit, and a regiment is a bigger unit, and a brigade division. And so you see they use that terminology all the time um, in the battle. Now, because Buford's troops were in the cavalry um, and they're going to be fighting the infantry from the Confederacy, they have to kind of um, uh, position themselves to do so. So what would typically happen with, when a Union cavalry um, or actually a Confederate cavalry for that matter, they would fight in infantry style, so to speak, is they would get off their horses and one guy would stay in the back and essentially hold um, four horses. So you can see one, two, three, four horses here. And then his three counterparts would also dismount, but they would go fight. So if you have say 2000 cavalry troops and they're fighting this way, you really only have 1500 because five of, 500 of them have to hold the horses. Now you might be wondering, why don't they tie the horses to a tree? Uh, well, because they don't have 2,000 trees <laughs> that close by. Um, and they also need to keep the horses close by in case they have to escape. Um, so Buford's greatly outnumbered cavalry ends up getting in this entanglement with the Confederate infantry over this high ground. Now, initially, Buford is able to hold off the Confederates. But what happens is another army um, from Confederate General Ewell starts marching south and they also run into Buford. So while he's initially able to kind of hold his ground, so to speak, eventually when these other Confederate troops get here, now he's really outnumbered and he has to take off down south. But he does hold up the Confederate army long enough um, so that more Union troops can approach um, from the east and the south. And oh, by the way, if you visit Gettysburg, they have this really cool um, self-guided tour that you can take in your car. Uh, there's also an uh, audio tour that accompanies this, and it has all these key stops that you can check out along the way and describe the battle. And so the initial fighting took place 
northwest of the town of Gettysburg. Now, early on in the film, uh, there's a scene where uh, one of the Union generals ends up getting killed. That was actually Buford's boss, so to speak, or his commanding officer. That was Union General John Reynolds. Um, so a historical photo of him on the left. And then in the film, he's played by the actor John Rothman. So you see um, this Union officer get killed um, during the early stages of the battle. And he was Buford's commanding officer, uh, General John Reynolds. And so again, Buford um, really plays an important role in the battle and seeing that, hey, this Gettysburg spot, the high, there's a lot of high ground here. If we can hold this, we'll have a big advantage um, over the Confederates. And the film does a pretty good job of explaining that. But I feel like the film, um, if you know more about the context of the battle, you'll be able to understand and appreciate the film a lot better. So I want to make sure you aware of that. And of course, where these early shots of the battle were fired are stacked. It's a statue and memorial to General John Buford, played by Sam Elliott, who's very well cast, if I may say so myself. Now, another key character in the film is played by Jeff Daniels, and he's portraying Union Colonel Joshua Chamberlain from Maine. And here's Jeff Daniels here in the center of this screenshot. And then a portrait of the real Joshua Chamberlain on the left and the Jeff Daniels actor photo on the right. So you can see the resemblance there. Now, Chamberlain did not go to West Point, um, unlike many of his counterparts and a higher ranking officer. Before the war, he was a college professor. And during the Battle of Gettysburg, he has claimed the fame was he held the position known as Little Round Top uh, against repeated attacks from the Confederates. Uh, and then towards the end of this particular battle of Little Round Top, he led a bayonet counterattack. Um, he was also featured prominently in the Ken Burns Civil War series. So if you saw that, you might uh, recognize or remember the name of Joshua Chamberlain. Now, there's another character in the film played by Kevin Conway, uh, a Sergeant Buster Kilrain. And he's an interesting character in the film because he interacts a lot with Chamberlain, uh, assisting him and uh, talking between the two of them. The one thing to note, though, is this particular character is fictional. So it's really kind of a composite of different individuals that were in this main uh, military unit. And sometimes filmmakers will do this. They'll create kind of these composite figures that aren't really uh, based on a specific person to kind of help the story along or fill in gaps uh, and stuff like that. But um, I wanted to point this out because so he's, he's a very cool, uh, interesting character in the film. And people might be like, oh, wow, what happened to him? Or, you know, what was his story? And like be trying to look it up on Google or something. <laughs> but um, he was not a real person. One of, the, I think, the only really char main character in the film that wasn't a real person. But anyway, Kevin Conway uh, portrayed him. Now, there's a really touching scene or moving scene where um, Jeff Daniels' character, Joshua Chamberlain, he ends up giving a speech to these troops. Um, and so this is one of the kind of key points of the film and one you should be on the lookout for. So when you see uh, Chamberlain getting up to give his speech to his troops, um, you probably don't want to run and go get your drink or beverage filled up. <laughs> this is a spot in the film you don't want to miss. It's a really um, interesting um, part of the film. His speech was very well done, very effective. He, he kind of talks about the motivations for fighting and the war and all that kind of stuff. So I just wanted you to be on the lookout for this particular scene. And then in the film, um, Chamberlain is assisted by his brother, who was a, a lieutenant, his younger brother, um, Thomas. And so this is actually another real character um, in the film. Uh, Thomas Chamberlain, um, Joshua Chamberlain's younger brother, is played very well by C. Thomas Howell. And then there's this famous painting, Civil War painting that you might have seen by Winslow Homer. So perhaps you've seen this painting before. It hangs at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. And the reason why I wanted to point this out is because this film called Prisoners from the Front is actually recreated <laughs> in a scene in the film. So this is C. Thomas Howell 
um, Chamberlain's younger brother. And these three gentlemen here are Confederate prisoners. Uh, they're being guarded by these two other um, Union troops. And so when you see this uh, scene in the film, and he actually, he's interacting with them and they're basically talking during this particular scene about, you know, why are you fighting and stuff like that. Uh, this particular scene kind of pays homage to this famous painting by Winslow Homer. So there's the painting by Winslow Homer. It's called Prisoners at the Front. Uh, you have kind of an older prisoner here and two younger guys. And now in, in real life, this was not the C. Thomas Howell character. Um, this is actually a Union uh, military officer general. Um, so the Howell character in the film is not this character in real life. So they did take a little bit of artistic liberty there. Um, the film does spend a fair amount of time um, having the actors talk amongst themselves about why are they fighting? Um, are they fighting for country or for honor or uh, you know, the impact that slavery has on things or you heard about state rights and all that stuff. Um, so there's quite a few scenes in the movie where the individual characters are kind of talking about their motivations. Um, so something to be on the lookout for as well. And then the book that the film was based off of was called Killer Angels. And what does that term mean? Uh, it was actually thought, the director initially thought that the film should be called Killer Angels, uh, but Ted Turner thought it'd be better to call it um, uh, Gettysburg is because he thought, you know, that's more of a well-known term than Killer Angels. But anyway, um, how that title came about is Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain, one of the major characters of not only the book, but also the film, uh, remembers a speech from Hamlet. Because remember, Chamberlain's a college professor. And this particular um, quote, what a piece of work is man in action, how like an angel. Um, and so Chamberlain mentions this to this Sergeant Buster Kilrain, um, the guy that reports to him. And uh, Kilrain says, well, if he's an angel, all right then, but he damn well must be a killer angel. And so there's this kind of conflict between on the one hand, these guys are kind of like angels and they're fighting for honor and states rights and country and all that stuff. But on the other hand, they're killers. So there's kind of a paradox between uh, being an angel and being a killer. And then the actual quote from the book says, and the old man, that would be the Buster Killering character, grinning, had scratched his head. And then he said stiffly, well, boy, if he's an angel, he's sure a murder an angel. And Chamberlain had gone on to school to make an oration on the subject, man, the killer angel. So that's where the title comes from, this quote from Hamlet. Um, now, the Union commander during this battle was... General George Meade. And in the film, he's played by Richard Anderson, who, uh, if you go back far enough in time, you might remember him. He, he was like Lee Major's boss on the Six Million Dollar Man, among other things. Um, but anyway, he's played in the film uh, here doing Meade. He's not really in the film all that much, just a few brief scenes here and there. Robert E. Lee has much more screen time during the film than Meade does. Uh, a little bit about George Meade, again, he's played in the film by Richard Anderson. He also lived um, several years after the Civil War. He died in 1872. He himself was a West Point graduate, class of 1839. He had just become the commander of the Union Army um, just shortly before the battle took place. So Lincoln uh, promoted him to be the head of the Army of the Potomac, which is what the Union Army in this area was called, on June 28th. And remember, the battle starts on July 1st. So he was still kind of getting uh, acclimated, so to speak, his role at Gettysburg as he was the overall Union commander. And his name is, I don't want to say it's lost to history, but he's not as well known of a figure um, on the Union Army side because later, um, Ulysses S. Grant was promoted over the top of Meade. Um, so then Grant ends up being the one who's kind of like the most well-known Union military figure. So that's kind of how that ends up playing out. Um, one of the things to be on the lookout for during the film is, again, we're talking about kind of the, the whole military strategy and tactics uh, things. And Meade had these war council meetings uh, where he would get together with his subordinates and they'd talk about what's going on and uh, decide what to do. One of the key 
uh, points in the film is when they decide to stay put at Gettysburg. There was some discussion uh, during the early stages of the battle, you know, maybe this isn't the best place to fight Lee. Maybe we should um, pull back and try and fight him somewhere else. Um, but the decision makers decided, no, 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 this is a good place to fight Lee um, because they hold the high ground. And so you should be on the lookout for that uh, during the film. This is General Hancock. Um, we'll talk about him a little bit later. And then this is General Meade and then some of the other characters. So again, kind of goes into that whole decision-making process, which was really important in both the battle and the film. And then of course, there's um, quite a few things related to Meade at Gettysburg. So this is the famous statue of him. And then the film portrayal. But you don't really see a lot of me. I actually, um, I don't have many criticisms of the film, um, but it would have been nice, in my opinion, to maybe have uh, <laughs> me a little bit more screen time because he's barely in the film at all. Uh, just a very short few segments here and there. Um, now, the reason why Meade was in charge and not the more well-known Ulysses S. Grant uh, was because Grant was in Vicksburg, Mississippi, um, fighting the Confederates there. Um, so after Vicksburg, which ended up being another big victory for the Union, in addition to Gettysburg, uh, Grant's promoted to be the commander of the overall Union forces. But at this particular time, uh, early July 1863, Meade's in charge of the army in Virginia, Grant's in charge of the army out west, and the out west army is fighting the Confederates at Vicksburg. So that's why Grant is not at Gettysburg, because he's, um, you know, halfway across the uh, front over in Mississippi. Another well-known Union figure, William Tecumseh Sherman, he also was not at Gettysburg because he was with Grant at Vicksburg. So again, if you're looking for Stonewall Jackson, uh, Ulysses S. Grant and Sherman, uh, you're not gonna find any of those guys because Jackson was dead and Grant and Sherman were off at Vicksburg. All right, so day two of the battle in the film really centers around Little Round Top. There was a lot more fighting that took place and they do kind of mention it in the film, um, but most of the actual uh, screen time, so to speak, focuses on this battle of the Little Round Top, which uh, featured Union General Joshua Chamberlain. Now, one of the things that's really fascinating about the film is you would think that it maybe would focus on Lee and Meade, and it does have a fair amount of Lee and a little bit of Meade, but it focuses much more on their subordinates. So like, for instance, look at the marketing material they put together for the film. Um, you have General Longstreet, uh, played by Tom Berenger over here. Um, and then over here, you have Joshua Chamberlain, uh, played by Jeff Daniels. And so there's a lot of other key characters that are involved. And to me, it's interesting that the film chose to focus on these two, as opposed to say, focusing on uh, Lee and me. And that was the way the book was set up as well. So another interesting character um, during the Civil War era was on the Confederate side, General John Bell Hood. And he's played in the film by Patrick Borman. Um, so you should be on the lookout for this. And this is an important scene because Lee wants to attack the Federals or the Union Army, uh, even though they hold the high ground. Uh, Longstreet does not think that's a good idea. He thinks they should bypass or redeploy their troops uh, and go fight somewhere else. Uh, Gorman holds the same opinion as Longstreet. He doesn't think this is a good idea uh, to fight there, which is interesting because during his career as a Confederate commander, uh, Hood was known as being very aggressive. Uh, but in this particular spot, he didn't think that this was a good idea either. So you have Lee's um, subordinate Longstreet doesn't think this is a good place to fight. His subordinate Hood also does not think it's a good place to fight, but they end up fighting there after all. And so again, you should kind of be on the lookout for the scenes that have John Bell Hood and James Longstreet in them. And then Hood is going up against several Union officers, but among them, uh, Union Colonel Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain, the Jeff Daniels character. So we get introduced to Daniels uh, character earlier on in the film, but this particular spot is where uh, he gets most of the screen time. So going back to our map of Gettysburg, remember um, the initial battle on day one, much of it took place over here with Buford. 
the little round top is over here. So John Bell Hood's army um, or troops are going to come up from the southwest and attack this position. This was a particularly important position in the battle because this is very high ground. And if you hold the high ground, what you can do is you can put artillery pieces up there and then rain down um, on the troops below. It's also much easier to hold the high ground if you're uh, doing an infantry battle. Um, so the Confederates know that they need to take this position and the, it's not shown on the map, but the way the Union Army is positioned is this was kind of what's known as the left flank. Uh, and the Union Army went this way and then circled around here. So it's kind of like a upside down J. And the Confederates are thinking if they can get past here, they can attack the Union from the uh, behind uh, and really do a lot of damage to them. But before they can do that, they need to take this position. So there's this big battle that takes place um, during the Battle of Gettysburg with a little round top. And so Hood's men, you can see Hood's name is here, uh, end up marching up the hill and they attack the troops here that are led by various uh, commanders in the Union or various officers in the Union side, but among them, Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain uh, of the Maine. He had the distinction of being, he was the furthest, uh, most outside position. So uh, here's where Chamberlain's troops were right here. There was no one beyond him. <laughs> it was just empty space. So he's holding the end of the line, uh, so to speak. So he had a very important position. And then this is what the little round top looks like in more recent times. So imagine uh, a bunch of Union troops up here in the woods and you're the Confederates and you have to not only go uphill, um, but get fired down upon uh, by the Union troops. And of course, it's early July. It's extremely hot out. Uh, the men had been marching and fighting for quite some time. Uh, so really challenging battle conditions. And the film does really a great job of kind of showing this um, small unit action, so to speak. Um, so the film is known for its picket charge scene, which we'll talk about later. But this particular spot in the film, uh, much less or much fewer troops uh, fighting very close at hand, including uh, even hand-to-hand uh, -hand combat. And Daniels, or Chamberlain, uh, is leading the troops at this point in time. Now, the Confederates in the real battle they actually attacked this position uh, several times trying to take it. Um, and the film does a pretty good job of portraying the battle sequence, how it actually took place. Um, now, eventually the Union <laughs> troops uh, essentially run out of ammunition uh, and they know the Confederates are gonna charge again because that's what they've been doing uh, all afternoon. Um, and so they're trying to decide what they should do. Some of the people think that on the Union side that they should retreat because they don't have any ammunition to fire on the charging Confederates. Uh, but Chamberlain, going back to him, he decides that no, we can't retreat because if we do, uh, the Union will lose this key spot and that'll have very detrimental consequences. So what he tells his men to do is attach bayonets and says, let's charge forward downhill at the Confederates um, and hopefully we can repulse them that way. So that's what they end up doing. That's actually ends up what's taking place. Uh, they end up defeating the Confederates um, and they um, surrender at this particular location and they end up holding the little round top. Now, if you go visit this place, this is one of the key um, most well-known or well-visited tourist spots at Gettysburg. Um, and so you can see it's got this great view. So you can see how advantageous it would be to hold uh, this position because you could position um, cannons up here and the Confederates are essentially down here in these woods and beyond, and you could fire on them. Um, you could observe them and see what they're doing. So very important real estate, uh, which is why it was so heavily fought for. Um, and again, that's the role that Joshua Chamberlain plays. His troops were from Maine, um, but there were several other troops that were fighting in this area, including from Pennsylvania, New York, my home state of Michigan, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then here's a memorial to the 20th Maine. They were the group that was on the far uh, edge of the Union line. And then this is a great spot to visit. This is a memorial for the troops from New York. And you can climb up into this tower. It's got this really beautiful view um, of the battlefield. So make sure you check that out when you visit in person. 
All right, so let's talk. That's the first part of the Gettysburg film. Let's talk about the second part. And the main focus of part two of the Gettysburg film is the day three battle known as Pickett's Charge. Um, in particular, the impact that the Confederate generals Lee, Longstreet, and Pickett played in the day's events. Now, there's kind of a subplot story that takes place between this gentleman, Confederate General Lewis Armistead, who was played by Richard Jordan in the film, he's a very interesting character in the film, and his Union counterpart, General Winfield Scott, who was played by Brian Mallon. And so uh, let's talk about Winfield Scott Hancock. He again played by Brian Mallon in the film. He also a graduate from West Point, uh, class 1844. Now you might remember earlier we were talking about the fact that General John Reynolds was killed during the battle. Um, after that took place, uh, Meade essentially gave Hancock a battlefield promotion and put him in charge of a number of the troops at Gettysburg. Um, so he was important in that regard. He also was very important, and they show this in the film because Meade, who just showed up on the scene, uh, isn't quite sure what's going on because he's so new. And he essentially asks his troops or his officers during this one of his war councils, hey, is this a good place to fight? And Hancock was, yeah, we should fight here. We have the high ground. We have the edge or the advantage over the Confederates. Let's not retreat. Let's fight Lee here. Um, so he's very important historically in that regard. And then during the film, again, there's a subplot between Hancock and his close friend, General Armistead. So Armistead, this character, and Hancock, this character, were close friends before the war. And they know they're facing each other at Gettysburg. and They're kind of wondering um, how that's going to play out. And that's actually a real story. That actually really did take place. So again, you might be watching that thing. Oh, this is a bunch of Hollywood made up BS. No, that actually really took place <laughs> during the battle. And so it's something you should be on the lookout for. Now, I won't tell you how it plays out. You might know because it's kind of a somewhat of a well-known story, the Battle of Gettysburg. But um, eventually, Armistead and Hancock uh, end up facing each other, their troops do, during the battle. But I won't tell you how it plays out. You'll have to actually watch the film. And so there they are. So Armistead was part of Pickett's charge and it just so happens his close friend from before the war, Hancock, they were like brothers, um, was on the defensive side of the Union. All right, so let's talk about the uh, relationship between Longstreet and Lee. Um, you know, Lee is, has this reputation for being a brilliant uh, military leader. And, but in the film, you really get a, uh, they really highlight the fact that during Gettysburg, he and Longstreet were not on the same page as far as how the battle should be fought. Um, so something to keep on the lookout for. Uh, some of the other characters you'll see in the film, uh, this was Lee's aide de camp, essentially. Uh, there's this major Taylor uh, who is in quite a few scenes and he, he's a really interesting character in the film. It would be, um, be fascinating to learn more about him. He does all different types of things for Lee as, scouting out places of the battlefield, um, you know, arranging things for Lee, uh, just doing basically kind of jack of all trades. But this was actually a real person. The uh, person he played in real life was Confederate Major Walter H. Taylor. So you can look out for him. And then we mentioned before, you don't really see uh, much of Jeb Stewart uh, in the film. There is a scene though, where he um, shows up and Lee basically, um, um, is upset that he's been gone for so long. Um, so you should be on the lookout for that um, scene. He's Stewart's mentioned many times in the film, but this is the main scene where he actually makes a appearance. Um, and in the Battle of Gettysburg, he did play a really important role with his absence. Um, and then also he was very involved um, in things kind of outside the scope of the film. So uh, if you want to learn more about Stewart and Gettysburg, you can research that on your own. Um, interesting to see, though, how the contrast between Stewart's character um, 
or Stewart himself was at Gettysburg because he's kind of missing in action, so to speak. He's off. Stewart's essentially off doing other stuff <laughs> while the battle is uh, underway, and you kind of contrast that with the role that Buford had to play. So Buford essentially was one of the key players in determining the fact that the Battle of Gettysburg should be fought where it was, um, and you kind of contrast that with Stewart, who was just not around. Um, so even though they were kind of adversaries, so to speak. And then he, again, you have this dynamic between Longstreet and Lee. They both, they had tremendous respect for one another. Um, they just, they had very different opinions on how this uh, particular battle should play out in the film, did a pretty good job of capturing that. Film as you just see all these cannons <laughs> shooting off uh, during the film. So that was really interesting. And then one of the aspects I like personally about the film Gettysburg is not only do you get to see the infantry troops, uh, and we talked previously about the role that the cavalry played, but you also get to see the impact of the artillery, uh, which played a very important role in not only the Battle of Gettysburg itself, but the Civil War in general. So nice to see that the three uh, different branches are so well represented here. And then if you actually go to Gettysburg in person, um, this was a trip <laughs> that I went on before the year before COVID, um, they actually do a lot of cool stuff there. So this particular day, they were having a artillery demonstration. And so this is me over here on the right. Um, and this is the people, we took a bus trip from Washington DC um, up to Gettysburg, because it's a short drive. Um, and so they, the park service team essentially taught us how to shoot off this cannon. And so we went through this training program, you know, it didn't last very long, just a few minutes, but everyone had like a very specific job. I was the ramrod guy. Um, so I rammed this down the barrel of the cannon, they load the piece and, you know, pull the thing, fire it off. But anyway, you just really got this new appreciation for the artillery. Um, when you learn how these devices were operated and all the different aspects of them, um, kind of how dangerous this work was and also the kind of damage that could um, be done and the different types of artillery pieces that they would shoot off depending on what the target was, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So if you go to Gettysburg in person, uh, they have a lot of these really cool programs that you could participate in to learn about different things going on. Uh, and another person's key player at Gettysburg is General George Pickett. And of course, he's the person that Pickett's charged is named after. He was not the guy who decided to do Pickett's charge, but he was the person who was uh, tasked with kind of carrying out Lee's orders. And the film he's played by Stephen Lang. And just to give you a sense where Pickett's charge took place, this is probably the most popular um, scene of the battlefield, just because this is the most probably important part of the battle. So the Union troops were positioned here. Uh, again, they're kind of in like a J, upside down J shaped position. So if you follow my arrow here, so picture the Union line looking like this. And the Confederates are over here. And there's a big mass of Union troops south of this blue box. And there's another big mass north of the Union box. And so Lee thinks that the soft spot is right in the center. And so he thinks if he attacks here, and defeats this position that these two sections here, the one north and the one south will just collapse. So essentially cut them in two uh, and they'll cave in and et cetera, et cetera. So that's what his plan is. It didn't quite work out uh, that way. And if you get a chance to visit Gettysburg again, this is perhaps the most visited or well-known spot of the battlefield. And so this is the spot where the Union troops were positioned. Um, at the beginning of Pickett's Charge. And you can see this tree line over here in the distance, that's where the Confederates were. And it's just really incredible to stand here or walk along this area uh, and to think of what this must have been like on July 3rd, 1863, uh, during the time of Pickett's Charge. And then here's another vantage point. And again, the Confederates were positioned where these trees are. It was a little bit over a mile. Um, that they had to ground, they had to cover. They were going slightly uphill, the Confederates were. They also had to get past this fence. Um, and then there's artillery, Union artillery raining down um, on the Confederate troops. So a really challenging situation. Um, now, if you go to Gettysburg in person, 
you really want to visit this spot. So this is off the Confederate side. So this is where um, the Confederates are positioned. This is from the tree line. And they're going to have to, this photo is a little bit blurry, sorry. Uh, but they were focused on this clump of trees here. That's kind of where the, all the troops were supposed to meet up at um, when they turned. But you can see this is a really long way. So it's uh, a little over a mile. It's uphill. There's that fence to contend with. There's you know, people on the other side shooting at you. So it's really incredible to stand here and kind of visualize what it must have been like for the troops on either side, uh, Union or Confederate feet in this position. Now, uh, a good thing to do would be to watch the film Gettysburg because it has a really excellent portrayal of Pickett's charge and uh, the battle itself. Uh, a better thing to do is if you can actually go to the Gettysburg battlefield, that's really awesome, of course. But the best thing to do is to actually make this walk from where Pickett's charge started all the way up to this Union line. And so I've actually made that walk before. I walked from the Confederate side of the Union line and then back again. And you really get a sense of how difficult it would have been for the Confederates um, to actually make that charge. Now, they thought that they would outnumber um, the Union by a ratio of about three to one. Lee thought that he would have about 15,000 troops going up against 5,000. So he thought he could pull it off. Um, when in fact, the Confederates only had about maybe 12 or 13,000. Um, and there were many more troops than 5,000 of the Union side. We'll talk more about that in just a moment. Uh, Lee also thought that the artillery would be able to soften up the defenses uh, more so than they were actually able to. So that was another problem for him. But again, if you get a chance and you visit Gettysburg, I think if I had to guess, 90 some percent of the people do not make this walk. And it is a fair amount. I mean, not everyone can walk two miles round trip. But if you're able to, if you have the time and the physical ability to do so, I really, really, really recommend making this walk um, along the Pickett's Charge. You just get so much more of an appreciation of uh, this particular aspect of the battle. And again, here's George Pickett, played by Stephen Lang. Now, before, you know, Pickett's Charge is so well known, but, you know, what were these guys thinking before the charge actually took place? Well, they were very optimistic, uh, with the exception of Longstreet. <laughs> they were very optimistic that they could pull this off, and you get a sense of that during the film. And the troops are in the woods getting ready to attack. And then off they go. And so this is another one of the things that makes the film so epic is because there were over 3,000 of the Civil War reenactors that participated um, in this actual recreation of Pickett's Charge. And then looking at things from the Union side, uh, this is the famous painting of the Battle of Gettysburg. So this is the Union line here. Um, there's a stone wall here which also aided in the Union defense um, and the Confederates are coming towards them. So it must have been really scary uh, to be on either side of the battle during this particular time. And then as the battle gets underway, eventually Pickett realizes that it's not going to be successful. But the actual charge itself is really epic. I mean, I know that term is used a lot <laughs> in different contexts, particularly film, but there's no other way to describe this. Yeah, it's really epic, this scene. So uh, it's the most famous scene of the whole film. Um, the whole, the entire film is great. Uh, this particular uh, scene, really outstanding, very well done. And then this is um, text from the National Park Service. So this is known as the high water mark of the Confederacy. So this is the furthest point that the Confederates got during the battle. And then after the battle, which the Confederates lost, um, even though the war drags on for almost two years, it's essentially downhill after this. And so this is known as the high water mark of the Confederacy. So you can see late in the afternoon. Uh, oh, and just to give you the context. So this is looking south. So the Confederates were coming from this direction on the right. The Union was positioned along here. Um, the, U the Confederates actually did get to this point and some actually got over the wall and the hand-to-hand -hand combat starts taking place, et cetera. Um, so late in the afternoon after a two hour cannonade, so the Union um, was under attack by Confederate artillery for two hours before the Confederates attacked. Some 7,000 Union soldiers repulsed the bulk of the 12,000 man Pickett's Charge 
against the federal center. So Lee thought that he would have 15,000 men going up against 5,000, um, but it actually, because they had suffered so many losses, the Confederates were actually only able to field about 12,000. And there was actually more Union troops um, on their side than Lee thought. So Lee thought it would be 15,000 of his guys going up against 5,000 Union soldiers, but in fact, it was 12,000 against 7,000. Um, and it was mitigated by the fact that they were going uphill, um, they're getting attacked, the Confederates are by the Union artillery, uh, they have to get over the fence, and they have to go over this wall, it was hot out, they were tired, they'd been marching and fighting, et cetera, et cetera. So this was the climactic final moment of the Gettysburg Battle, the high water mark of the Confederacy. And then after the Pickett's charge was repulsed, on July 4th, after three days of fighting, Lee's Confederate Army began retreating back to Virginia. Total casualties, killed, wounded, captured, and missing for the three days of fighting were 23,000 for the Union Army and as many as 28,000 for the Confederate Army. So perhaps 51,000 men killed, wounded, captured, and missing at this Battle of Gettysburg. And so then this is Pickett's Charge, the high water mark of the Confederacy. And if you get a chance, make sure you visit the site in person. This is the statue that commemorates the spot. And this is another view. So this was the Union line right here. There's this um, short stone wall. So picture uh, 7,000 Union troops positioned along here, and then picture uh, 12,000 Confederates coming this way across this field. And there you go. So let's talk about some things that happened after the battle, just to kind of wrap things up. The movie doesn't go have time to go into <laughs> what took place. Um, of course, there were a lot of casualties, a lot of men killed. There's a big cemetery at Gettysburg, um, which is really moving to visit. Uh, think about all the Americans that lost their lives here, uh, both Union and Confederate. Uh, Gettysburg is also famous for Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, which took place on November 19th, 1863. The film doesn't get into this um, stuff. It just doesn't have time, but I just wanted to kind of give you the rest of the story so you can see how this fits in with the big historical picture. And there is Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. Again, it was, the battle was July 1st through 3rd, 1863. Lincoln's Gettysburg Address was delivered on November 19th. Now, at the same time the Gettysburg battle was taking place, another very significant uh, battle was also being fought, and that was at Vicksburg uh, with Ulysses S. Grant leading the Union forces to victory there. Um, and interestingly enough, the Vicksburg battle ended um, the same time, well, essentially July 4th. Um, so 4th of July weekend, 1863, you have these two big battles culminating. Um, Meade at Gettysburg and then Grant at Vicksburg, two real big turning points in the history of the Civil War. Um, afterwards, Lincoln promotes Grant uh, to be in charge of the overall Union forces. Um, and then through the leadership, they end up continuing on the fight. Um, other things that happened during the Civil War, um, US colored troops start participating um, and have a very significant impact on the outcome of the war. Um, the slaves end up getting freed, et cetera, et cetera. Um, one of the reasons why Lee wanted to invade the North is he thought that he could turn public opinion in the North against the war. Um, so remember, this is the summer of 1863. Uh, the election is gonna take place the following year. Lee thinks that he can impact potentially the war or the um, election, but he does not win that battle. Um, there's kind of a surge in Lincoln's popularity and he ends up winning re-election easily in 1864, Abraham Lincoln does. Um, and then the war continues on with Grant uh, leading the way. And then eventually Lee surrenders to Grant at Appomattox. So that takes place in April of 1865. Remember the Battle of Gettysburg was July of 1863. So not quite, uh, two years of fighting after Gettysburg. Uh, and then of course, Lincoln is unfortunately assassinated at Ford's Theater. And if you're in Washington, DC, you can visit the Lincoln Memorial. 
And then we have a separate program that we do on Abraham Lincoln Lincoln Memorial. Um, we do it live periodically, so you can join us for that. There's also a recording of it on our YouTube channel, which is Washington, D.C. History and Culture. If you get a chance, you should check out and subscribe to our YouTube channel. We have over 200 historical programs on there. Um, so check that out, Washington, D.C. History and Culture. And then if you're in Dallas, Fort Worth area, um, we periodically arrange trips or tours of the Texas Civil War Museum. Um, and so this is something that we're gonna be doing again in the near future. The Texas Civil War Museum, uh, very well done in Fort Worth, Texas, um, has a lot of cool stuff to see. So if you wanna go join us for that, um, you can check out our sister group, which is called Dallas, Texas History and Culture. Uh, you can find out about those programs on Eventbrite, Facebook, Meetup, and we also have a Dallas, Texas History and Culture YouTube page. But of course, the best thing to see, to learn about this battle is to go to Gettysburg itself and see the battlefield in person if you can. It's a very moving experience. I've visited this site a number of times, uh, always enjoyed myself, always learned a lot, always see new things, learn new things, uh, et cetera, et cetera. All right, so whenever I do these programs, people always ask like, well, what are, what are some books about Gettysburg? Are there any other films about Gettysburg or the Civil War? So let's just take a minute and go for that. Um, if you are going to be visiting Gettysburg, I really recommend getting the official visitor guide and really purchase it before you go, because if you know more about the battle uh, before you actually visit in person, you'll get much more of an impactful experience. So if you can, um, I know most people buy these types of books after their visit or when they're leaving, which is fine. I do that myself. But for this, because Gettysburg was such a, a monumentous and important and complex event, if you know more about it, beforehand, you'll have a much more impactful visit. So I recommend getting the official guidebook before your visit if you can. And then two other books that I really like about the Civil War. Um, there's a Time Life series that came out many, many years ago. It's no longer in print, um, but if you get a chance, you should check that out. You can buy used copies um, of this set. So I have, it's 27 or 28 volume set of the Civil War. So there's one book on Gettysburg, there's one book on Antietam, there's one book on the Lincoln assassination, um, but a really well done series, it has a lot of great pictures and maps and visuals, the text is really well written. Um, so if you get a chance, you should check that out. Uh, another really interesting book, I know we have a lot of people following us in Washington DC, the Smithsonian uh, put out a book that describes the Civil War collection that's at the Smithsonian. So you can learn about the Civil War through these objects in the Smithsonian collection. So I really like that book as well. And then as far as films go, after the success of Gettysburg, they made a quote unquote prequel uh, called Gods and Generals, which also has Jeff Daniels and Stephen Lang in it. Um, it didn't have Martin Sheen, it had Robert E. Lee portrayed by Robert Duvall. Uh, so if you're a big Civil War buff or wanna learn uh, more about the Civil War, or if you really like the Gettysburg film, you can check this out. Now, the Gods and Generals wasn't as highly regarded <laughs> by both critics and the public as the Gettysburg film was. You might want to read up on it before you uh, watch it just to see if it's your kind of thing. Um, if I had to guess, I'd say if you're really into the Civil War, you'll probably like Gods and Generals. If you're maybe not as into the Civil War, if, um, maybe not like as much. But anyway, um, that's out there. And then just some other films related to the Civil War that, you know, there's a lot of films about the Civil War, of course, but some of the better, more well-known ones that I've seen that I really recommend, it's an older film, uh, The Red Badge of Courage. Uh, it's based on Stephen Crane's book, the same name, so you can check that out, starring Audie Murphy. And then another iconic Civil War film is, of course, Glory, about the 54 Massachusetts U.S. Colored Troops. And then the Ken Burns Civil War documentary. So if you if you participate in our live programs, I was actually gonna see if I could stream the Civil War series because I have the DVD set. So still trying to work out the logistics of that. Um, but stay tuned for that if you participate in our live programs that we do. Another interesting film was Andersonville about the notorious prison in Georgia. So another Civil War film you might wanna check out. And then last but not least, the Steven Spielberg film Lincoln was an interesting perspective on the Civil War from the viewpoint of 
President Abraham Lincoln. But of course, today we've been talking about the great film Gettysburg. So hopefully that gives you a good preview uh, and analysis of the film Gettysburg. So appreciate everyone joining and watching this video. And again, these were kind of the takeaways. So if you are things to be on the lookout for as you're watching the film Gettysburg. So if you want to take a screenshot of this or a picture with your phone, so some kind of some key things to focus in on, uh, why and how was Gettysburg won and lost? Uh, Robert E. Lee's invasion of the North, what was his motivations for doing that? The military strategy and tactics of Lee, Meade, Buford, Longstreet, Chamberlain, etc. cetera. Uh, the Confederate military intelligence or lack thereof with General Stewart and the spy Harrison. Uh, the Gettysburg battle location, the fact it was a very chance encounter. Uh, the day one, which focuses on Cemetery Ridge and Union General John Buford. Day two, which focuses on Little Round Top and Union General Joshua Chamberlain. And day three, which focuses on Pickett's Charge and the Confederate Generals Lee, Longstreet, and Pickett. Uh, we talked about the term killer angels and what that means. And then again, if you're watching the film, you should kind of really be on the lookout. It was interesting, uh, the actors saying their motivations for fighting uh, in this battle. And then also just kind of the camaraderie uh, between the troops was very well done. So that's the end of our synopsis of Gettysburg. So thanks so much for joining us. Uh, we do programs like this on a regular basis. If you get a chance, you should make sure you check out and follow or subscribe to our YouTube channel, which is Washington DC History and Culture. So with that, I will sign off. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a great rest of your day and we'll see you next time.